Welcome to Worship on this Memorial Day weekend. My name is Joel Banderwell. I'm one of the pastors here at Incarnation. Later on in the service, Pastor Kai Nielsen will be delivering the message, and he'll be beginning our new sermon series called I Wonder. Uh, back in April, we asked the community for a number of questions and doubts and things they were wondering about in regards to faith and God. And we were overwhelmed by the number of uh, responses we got. And so this summer, we're going to take some time to talk about those different topics. So thank you for participating in that. We look forward to exploring those questions and doubts with you this summer. This is Memorial Day weekend, and so we want to acknowledge uh, all those uh, military service personnel who have given up their lives uh, for freedom and for peace across the world. Thank you for your service, uh, and thank you to the families who had to give up one of their loved ones for that. Later on in the service, we'll take some time to pray for you uh, and pray that you'll experience God's peace and comfort, uh, especially during this weekend. If you're in active duty or if you are retired in the military service, again, thank you for your service to this country. Summer is just around the corner, and that means that Vacation Bible School is coming just in a few weeks. If you haven't signed up for it yet, there's still a few spots available. You can visit our church website or click on the link in this email uh, to sign up for Vacation Bible School. It will be held outdoors, and we are in need of a few more volunteers. And so if you're willing to help volunteer that week, uh, whether it be the whole week or whether it just be a day, uh, feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to connect with you about what those opportunities could involve. Also, uh, beginning in June, we're going to be having our contemporary worship service back in Incarnation Hall. Uh, so pay attention to your emails, pay attention to the website uh, so that you can be up to date as to where and when that service will be held in Incarnation Hall. Those are all my announcements as we begin worship today. Uh, we're going to begin by reading from the end of Matthew's Gospel. After Jesus has died and has been risen again, he invites the disciples to meet him on a mountaintop. Hear these words from the book that we love. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May the Lord bless this reading to our lives today.
Let's pray together. God, you're the fount of all blessings of goodness and life and hope. And so on this day, we give you thanks for all the ways that we can gather as community on this larger weekend in the uh, context of our country. We pray for times for us to be able to gather with one another, to celebrate those who've chosen a vocation of peacekeeping in our world, even to giving their own lives. And so we pray that as we gather with one another and receive your blessing, we also might imagine ourselves as being part of a continuation of that blessing for those certainly who are peacemakers, but also for all of us who can be peacemakers in the world. We pray, oh God, that you would continue to bless us. Give us a sense of your confidence and assurance and hope, no matter where we are in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good to have you here. Thanks for being with us on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we're also going to use this as a way to start our sermon series called My Wonder. Uh, for those of you who are part of the community, you'll know that about six weeks ago or so, we asked the congregation to just uh, give us questions about what things you're struggling with in regard to life or faith, etc. Uh, I think we ended up with maybe a hundred possibilities. It was fantastic. So we, we lumped them in together into, into big categories and kind of drilled down uh, for some of the categories. But one we're going to start with is this. Um, what does God ask of my daily life? What does God ask of my daily life? So many people uh, ask the question, I'm, you know, I'm just not quite sure as a follower of Jesus what I should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I'm not going to be hyper-prescriptive in regard to that. But I think that there is a way for us to talk about the framework about how we understand our lives as followers of Jesus. And so we're going to use the text for today that Pastor Joel read at the beginning of the sermon, or the service, from Matthew 28 as our guide. It's the Great Commission. You'll know that if you've been around the, the church for a while. And so let me take you back to that. And basically what we're going to do today is just a slow roll through those last five verses. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I love that phrase. I just love that phrase. And it happens also with Thomas' story uh, in John's Gospel. So here these people are who've been the closest to Jesus, who'd heard his promises, who understood the kind of mission in the best way that they could that he was inviting them into, had been crushed at his time of death, and now they're experiencing him uh, in his resurrection. You would think those would be the people who would be most full of confidence and most full of sure, surety as they made their way forward. And yet it says, some of them worshipped and some of them doubted. I just hope that gives you a little permission that if you're struggling with some things, if there are parts of your life that aren't clear, if there are parts of your faith that just don't seem to have traction right now, that really you're just part of a whole line of 2,000 years of followers of Jesus as we've been trying to figure this out with one another. And it goes on and says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What's fascinating about Jesus, and I think this is critical for us to just kind of keep framed up in our minds, is that Jesus doesn't keep uh, authority or power to himself. In fact, he offers it. He releases it. He gives it to us. You probably heard me use the language a lot about us being co-creators of a better, more loving world. Uh, that's what I think Jesus is doing. He's inviting us into the process of imagining and then creating the world that he imagined and wants us to create from the very beginning. So he gives us the authority. He gives us the power. He releases it. He doesn't keep it to himself. And then these words of the, um, that we call the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let me go back and we'll just kind of tease out a couple of the words and phrases that are part of that. As we think about what it means for us to, to live in everyday life as Jesus' followers. Uh, the first one is, is real easy? It says go. And it doesn't mean 
go to church. It doesn't mean go to Sunday school. It doesn't mean go to my small group, though those are important. What it means is go. Go into the world. The very place that you are that you find yourselves every day is the place that Jesus has invited you to be. Honor that. Know that. Acknowledge it. John Oakbridge has this great phrase. He said um, something like, uh, God is not interested in an abstract thing called your spiritual life. God is interested in your life. Each part of it. Your normal, everyday life. Which means that as you are a parent, you also are a follower of Jesus. Who you are as a student is who you are as a follower of Jesus. Who you are as an employer is who you are as a follower of Jesus. Who you are as an employee is who you are as a follower of Jesus. Who you are as a community member is who you are as a follower of Jesus. Who you are as a friend or a neighbor is who you are as a follower of Jesus. So he doesn't say go off into some exotic place and that's where you're going to do the real work. In some ways, Jesus is basically just saying to us, go back to your life. Go back to your life. There you're going to be my people. Go therefore and make disciples. I uh, love to kind of parse out that word a little bit because I think it's critical for one. Sometimes I think when we talk about uh, discipleship, um, we talk about a move to all the stuff that we need to know to be followers of Jesus, which is critical. Um, but discipleship for Jesus, uh, as a rabbi in the first century, was much more than what you know at any given time. What Jesus was inviting his disciples, and now the word means learner, it means student, it means apprentice, critical. What Jesus is inviting us as learners and as apprentices to do is not only to to know some of the things that he knows about how the history and how they're connected to God's life from the very beginning, but also to be the kind of people that Jesus is in this world. So you're not just learning cognitive things, you're learning how to be in this world and you're learning how to be his compassion, you're learning how to live his justice, you're learning how to offer his welcome into the world. That's what it means to be disciples to be followers, to be learners. Every once in a while I think about who we are in the Christian community and, and uh, ask myself, really, what have we learned over the years? Really, what have we learned about this life? Recently I was uh, down at the George Floyd Memorial uh, and I was remembering that it was a year ago this week that George Floyd was killed. and. At that time, I was actually in Norfolk, Virginia with my wife, Patty, and my son and daughter-in-law, and we were just helping them settle into their new home. Got a text from friends of ours who said, what's happening in your city? I said, I don't know. And they said, you better check out CNN. Went to CNN and saw on CNN the images of the city in flames. And you just began to be so kind of remorseful and, and like, wow, what is going on? With our world? What have we learned as people trying to live with one another across our divisions of race and gender and etc.? What have we actually learned? Now it's a year later and it is fascinating. I went down to the memorial again and you'll see a picture of it here. Um, the day after uh, Derek Chauvin was convicted and what was fascinating for me is just to see the things that people had laid out again to listen to the stories that, that parents were telling their kids as they were walking around, to, to watch friends just try to make sense of the world that we're living in and what's happening right now, and claiming hope but knowing we still have so much uh, farther to go along the way, seeing all the TV cameras around. But I kept going back to that whole question, what have we actually learned? Have we learned many more about the story cognitively about who Jesus is, but even more so? Have we learned his way of compassion? Have we learned his way of justice? Have we learned his way of mercy and forgiveness? Have we learned more about his way of love? So you, you go, says Jesus, that's the part of the Great Commission, back to your life, go to those normal places in life, and there you get a chance to learn and to experiment and to grow into a sense of what it means to be a learner, an apprentice of Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. 
It's interesting, if you look at uh, Matthew's Gospel here, at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, he gives us a genealogy. And he starts with Abraham and Sarah, the patriarch and matriarch of the people of Israel, and takes you all the way through uh, 42 generations to the point of where Jesus is born. And it's fascinating. It is a picture, a genealogical picture of one tribe. Now, at the end, what does it say? It isn't just about that one tribe, is it? We have been asked to participate in extending ourselves to all nations of the earth. What it's saying is that uh, Jesus, I think, came to push us out of this sense of tribalism, the sense of us versus them, the sense of in versus out. I think that's maybe one of the core messages that Jesus came to bring. We are so much more than we've allowed ourselves to be created, whether it's by our ethnicity or our orientation or class that we're dealing with, rich, poor, uh, young and old. All of those things, Jesus says, are boundaries that we need to just wash away to be able to experience more deeply what it means to be his people. Last week, we talked about the Pentecost story. And what was the Pentecost story? Basically, the Pentecost story was when the Spirit of God comes and is alive in people's hearts. The, the differentiation of, of language begins to be overcome. The, the differentiation, what keeps us from a relationship with our ethnicity, begins to be overcome. Gender, age, it just goes down the list throughout all nations. Go, go back into your own life. Go back into your normal life. Learn what it means to be a Jesus person. And know that that Jesus story extends to all people. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, certainly that it has two connotations for us. One is the, the ritual part of our life in community with one another where people are incorporated into the body of Christ. Baptismo also means to just submerge yourself, to immerse yourself into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to become more deeply connected and rooted in the part of the story that we see in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So to be baptized or to baptize one another in that name is to immerse ourselves more deeply, we could say, in the Jesus story, to, again, know it more deeply and to live it more vibrantly. I remember my mom coming back from a, a two-year experience she had at Harvard Divinity School and uh, I remember some people from her congregation who were a little bit anxious when she went there to get her master's in divinity. And so she, uh, because it was the center of pluralism, they thought, well, maybe she would lose her faith when she went there. Well, I remember a, a phrase that she used when she came back that really struck me. She said, when I went there, two things happened. I became more uh, committed to my life of faith. She immersed herself more deeply in that Jesus story. But she came also more deeply respectful of all of the different religious traditions. That can happen. That, I think, is part of the, word, the way that we live in this world, is become more deeply connected to our story and to know that that story, just by its absolute very nature, will extend us out with grace and welcome and hospitality to a world that just wants to be able to share something that's life-giving and hopeful. So we go to all nations and we, we baptize, we, we immerse people into that story and we allow them to experience something about the Jesus story and then allow the Spirit to do its work. We can't force anything on anyone. We just allow the Spirit to do its work. And then it says this, uh, you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and you teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Here's where the, the Great Commission meets the Great Commandment. And the Great Commandment for Jesus was this. He was asked, what is the primary commandment of all the 613 that are there in the first five books of the Bible? And he said, uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commands, all of the different laws and find their center. So what we teach people is about the love of God. And we teach them not just because we say the words, we teach them because we live the life. And finally, Jesus says, after all of this, remember 
I am with you always to the close of the age. And that simply means this. Um, when you doubt, God is with you. When you're decisive, God is with you. When you wonder about your life or about God or about the world around you, God is with you. When you wander, God is with you. When you're languishing in life, God is with you. When you feel most alive, there God is with you also. I love that, to take you back to that Orberg phrase. God's really not interested in an abstract thing called our spiritual life. God's actually interested in our lives. And so what I did is I took the language of uh, uh, Matthew 28 and the final verses and I dropped them into some different words and different images to give me a sense of what it means to live the kind of life that I believe Jesus is asking us to live these days. So go. Be real people in the real world. So go and be eminently curious about all of life, about your God, about the world around you, and about your role in it. Immerse yourself in Jesus' stories and, and prepare to be shocked by how expansive his love is for us and for the whole world. And then as you begin to know that love and to participate in it, live it, share it, invite others to experience it. Seek out excuses to extend love. And the God of the universe your God will be with you when you recognize it and even when you don't. Amen.
Will you pray with me, please? Holy and loving God, we come to you this day carrying burdens that are too heavy for us to endure. We lay down our shame, our brokenness, and our weariness, longing to find wholeness, healing, and rest. We give you thanks today for those who have gone before us, who have sacrificed their life fighting for freedom and for peace. We ask that you would send your spirit of comfort and grace to the families and friends that they left behind. We pray for your hedge of protection to be around all of our current military service members as they seek to serve this country. Lord Jesus Christ, on that day when you ascended to heaven, you invited your disciples to come and to see you. As they approached, they were filled with awe and wonder, and at the same time with questions and doubts. We can only imagine what it might have been like to see your resurrected body, to feel the wounds in your hands and your side to be filled with that same sense of wonder and awe and questions and doubts. You command us to go, to make disciples, to baptize and to teach them everything that you have taught us. Help us to better pay attention to the nudges of your spirit as we encounter our neighbors, our friends, and our family this week. Give us the courage to speak your truth and love through our words and through our actions of caring for one another. Holy Spirit, there are many in our community who continue to suffer and struggle with hospitalizations or recovering from surgery or receiving cancer treatment and even mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for your healing touch to be granted to all those on our prayer concerns list, whether that be for physical, mental, spiritual, or emotional healing. And grant us a double portion of your spirit that when we feel lost or hurt or hopeless, that we be reminded of Jesus' promise to be with us even to the end of the age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to take communion together, know that this table is open to all, that this is a place where all are welcome to come and to be nourished by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so, remembering me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it, saying, This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for all people. As often as you drink of it, do so, remembering me. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As you partake of uh, this holy gift, take it with these words, the body of Christ given for you, in the blood of Christ shed for you.
Friends, receive this blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's peace. Amen. Friends, go with these words. May you never wonder how much God loves you. Now go and serve our risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for worshiping with us. Have a blessed Memorial Day weekend. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.